Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Jordan Newman, as uh, Dr. Maxwell mentioned before. I'm one of the newer chiropractors um, at Total Body Health, and I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Knees are a big passion of mine, and uh, um, let's dive right in. So a little background about me. So I'm from White Rock, BC, and I grew up playing a variety of sports with basketball being my main passion. I played on multiple BC provincial teams and ended up playing for the UVic Vikes for three years. Uh, in November 2008, I tore my ACL uh, during a basketball game. It was a non-contact injury during a defensive slide at 16 years of age. And after that, I had to uh, undergo pretty much three years of rehab and three separate knee surgeries. I had ACL reconstruction in February 2009, uh, followed by a second ACL reconstruction after trying to come back um, and return to play and play basketball again in March 2010, and also had a meniscus arthroscopic repair on both sides of my meniscus. And then in September 2010, I had another surgery from my meniscus because I had a little bit of a um, tear that happened post-surgery after my second one and ended up having hemarthrosis, which is blood in the knee joint. And after having three, these three surgeries, I did go play for the Vikes. And it was a great experience. Uh, while I was playing for the Vikes, I did end up probably spraining my MCL, which is a ligament on the inside of your knee, on the medial knee, about three to four different times. And if I hadn't been playing with a knee brace, I would have torn my ACL again. So what I decided in my mid twenties is I kind of got my knee rechecked out, had an x-ray done, talked to my surgeon and doctors, and they said that I already had osteoarthritis in my knee. And they were telling me that I would need to have a knee replacement by the time I was 40 years old. So it was at this time that I decided to really take my knee rehab seriously and realize that it wasn't and isn't going to be like a one and done type of rehab. It's a lifelong journey where like consistency is the key and always putting in the work to make your knees better and more functional. So some of the symptoms that I had at that time were pain and crepitus, so kind of like that fabric ripping noise that you hear um, when you like squat or bend down. I had some popping and catching in my knee, sometimes just laying on the couch, walking. It didn't really matter on what position. Sometimes it would just happen. And a lot of pain with hiking, which is a big passion of mine, and especially with downhill. So downhill was a big issue. And then I still struggle with this today is some limited range of motion into knee flexion and also having knee valgus, which is where your knee kind of caves in with squatting and lateral walks. So those are some of the symptoms that I had and still kind of deal with today. And I'm hoping that this presentation will give some light and some tips and tricks on how to help manage yours. So I wanted to start off by just going over some common knee injuries. So it's usually broken down into traumatic and overuse. So traumatic is when there's one incident and that kind of causes that knee injury. So you can have knee contusions, muscle strains, usually of the quadriceps or the hamstrings, um, cruciate ligament sprains, which are, if you can see my mouse here, the ones kind of on the inside of the knee here, as well as uh, collateral ligament sprains. So these ones on the outside. So the medial one over here, and then the lateral one. Meniscus tears are very common <laughs> traumatically as well as um, from overuse as well too. And then you can also get patellar dislocation and bursitis due to impact. And then these are some common overuse knee injuries. So you have chondromalacia patella, also known as runner's knee, infrapatellar tendinopathy, also known as jumper's knee, quadriceps tendinopathy from kind of overuse of the quads or them being really tight. Osgood flatters, um, that's due to a bony prominence called your tibial tuberosity that ends up getting a little bit um, inflamed and with the tendon pulling on it when kids are growing. That's usually only in kids. 
And then you can have also bursitis due to overuse. So if you spend a lot of time um, spending on your knees, if you're a carpenter or if you do a lot of cleaning, those types of things, very common to see that as well too. And there is also with overuse injuries, the possibility of stress fractures. One thing I wanted to touch base on is that there are a lot of referral patterns to the knee. So sometimes it might not be the structures in the knee joint that are causing the pain, but they could be coming from somewhere else in the body, such as the lumbar spine. If you sometimes will get knee pain um, from having a disc herniation or disc pain, you can have sacroiliac joints, so your pelvis can have knee um, referred pain to the knee, as well as your hip, proximal thigh, and then there's lots of different muscles in the, in the thigh and also the lower extremity that will refer pain to the knee, such as your quads, your hamstrings, lateral. So I kind of put the trigger points on here. You can kind of see where the trigger point would be with the little X and how the referral pattern can go to the knee. So it's important when you're getting assessed by any clinician that they're, if you have knee pain, that they're not just looking at your knee joints individually, but that they're looking at the joints above and below. So some common compensations seen with knee pain are decreased weight bearing on the side of pain because you're trying not to put as much pressure through that knee. And that actually can cause some compensations on the other leg because your other leg starts to take over and has to do more work. Knee valgus while standing, running, or squatting. So you can see this first picture on the left here. This person's doing a, a step down and you can see the line that his knee is pretty straight. But the valgus force is shown in the image on the left where you can see that the knee is caving in. So what that does is it says that there's a decreased stability at the knee and it places an increased stress on the medial stability structures, particularly the MCL, ACL, and PCL. Another common compensation that you can see is external rotation of the tibia here. And that also makes you more susceptible to having knee valgus. Some common compensations I wanted to highlight in regards to gait is flex position of the knee during the stance phase, even if you have normal knee range of motion. So this can mean that the impairment is occurring at the hip or at the ankle and then you see the compensation at the knee joint. And so you're gonna see exaggerated hip flexion or ankle dorsiflexion during the stance phase that results in more flexion of the knee. So you could also have an excessive knee flexion during the swing phase. So you can see here how she's bringing the knee up really high. And this is usually due to reduced ankle dorsiflexion in that leg that she's walking forward with. So the knee has to bend more because they don't have enough ankle dorsiflexion to clear their toes. Otherwise their toes are gonna hit the ground as they're walking. And then last one is the knee is kept in extension during the loading phase. And this could mean that the person has weak quads. So they could end up having a forward trunk lean during the stance and that brings their line of gravity a little bit forward. Okay, sorry, this was the last one. And then the last one here is reduced knee flexion during the swing phase. So this could be due to a knee extension contracture. Contracture just means that there's a fixed tightening of the muscles. And this can result in hip hiking or hip circumduction. So when your hip kind of swings out around you during the gait cycle. Okay, so one thing I wanted to touch base on is when you are walking and if you are having knee pain and you have a little bit of a limp that you've noticed, I want you to count your steps. It's as easy as one, two, three. So when you're walking or running, try counting your steps, not one, two, but one, two, three, because using an odd number of counting prevents your body from getting into a rhythm and causes a different number to land on each step as you walk. So it helps to take out that rhythm that's associated with a limp. All right. So now after talking about those different kind of gait compensations, I wanted to touch base on a concept um, that we use a lot in the clinic called the kinetic chain. So the kinetic chain is um, really important when you're looking at different things that could cause knee pain. Like I said, that not everything that, not everything that causes knee pain comes from the knee. 
So when you look at the kinetic chain, you're looking at joints above and below. That's why when you go in for an assessment, it's really important that whoever's assessing you is looking up and down the kinetic chain, such as in the hip, ankle, lumbopelvic, and then also looking at your core stability as well too. So, so there's a, a few, I want to touch on a few things that are usually associated with knee pain or knee compensation is glute medius inhibition or inactivation. So your glute medius is one of your glute muscles and it's a really important stabilizer of the pelvis during single leg activities such as walking. And so if your glute medius isn't stabilizing, you're gonna see your hip drop on that side and then your knee can also cave in. And so if your glute is nice and strong, it helps to prevent knee valgus. Ankle stability is also an important part and you can help improve your ankle stability just doing daily things like barefoot walking outside, walking on uneven surface, such as the grass or the beach, reduce the amount of time that you wear cushioned shoes when you walk inside the house, and then also working on balance and do specific exercises that target your lower leg and foot muscles. So doing all those little things help to activate the intrinsic foot muscles, which are important for getting proprioception to the body and help to stabilize you there. So if you have a, a more stable ankle, then your knee doesn't have to necessarily do as much of the work. Whereas if your ankle is unstable, and then you might notice when you do exercises that your knee always caves in, it could be due to the ankle instability, not just the knee. And then lumbar and core stability. These are both really important because when you improve your core stability and your lumbar stability, this creates a more stable base when you're exercising, especially when you're performing explosive movements in sports and even walking around and doing daily activities. If you have a strong base of support, your extremities are gonna be feel a bit more stable when you're doing exercises. Okay, so this kind of um, regional interdependence also plays into the kinetic chain. So it refers to the concept that a patient's primary musculoskeletal symptoms may be directly or indirectly related to or influenced by injuries or dysfunctions from other areas of the body. So initially, local treatment to a patient's primary complaint is usually the first step in managing a patient's condition and always important to do. You wanna start with a source of pain, but if that's not getting better, this is where regional interdependence comes into play and is very helpful for cases and with patients who have persistent and chronic pain or symptoms that may be associated with functional limitations and impairments in other regions of the body, either proximally or distally. So as I mentioned before, in regards to the knee pain, you always wanna make sure that the person that's looking at your knee is looking at your ankle, your hip, and your lower back in order to optimize the patient's recovery and get you back to doing what you love most. All right, the quad to hamstring ratio. So this is something that's really important you want to have a good balance between your quads and hamstrings to prevent knee injuries, especially in young and developing athletes. If you have overdominant quads, especially in young females, they can impact an individual's ability to land from jumping activities, to decelerate and change direction in sports. And this can put a lot more stress on the cruciate ligaments of the knee, especially the ACL. And it's been shown that female athletes are two to eight times more likely to tear their ACLs than males. And so the ratio between the quad to, hamstring strength, quad to hamstring strength should be roughly four to three. So when you're doing exercises, it's really easy to do a lot of quad dominant exercises, but just don't neglect your hamstrings. It's important to strengthen and also stretch them properly. So the knee is supposed to be stable, stable joints, but for many of us, due to injury, poor biomechanics, anatomical variations, and age, it becomes an area of instability and pain. So how do we fix that? Coming in for treatment is a good first step, but you wanna make sure that you can do something at home as well. So exercises. And I kind of wanted to start with doing exercises from the foot and then go up to the hip, highlighting some ones that you might not know, and then just talking about some exercises that I like to do as well for my knee rehab. So it's important for your feet to have, be able to spread your toes. So if you can't spread your toes, these are some really good exercises to start with. So the toe piano, you're gonna lift up all of your toes and then try to lower each toe individually, starting with your pinky. 
You can also work on your opposite big toe and then other toe flexion and extension. And nice. also doing single leg stands with your hip elevated to 90 degrees. This works on balance, gets engagement of your intrinsic foot muscles and also gets hip flexion activation. And when you're doing exercises, it's really good to do them all in bare feet if you can. Because when you take out using the bottom of a shoe, it actually gives better proprioceptive feedback. And you can actually feel in your feet, your ankles, your knees, where you're kind of getting some compensations or where you need to be more stable in. So some ankle and lower leg exercises. Balance boards is great to increase ankle stability. You wanna make sure you perform it in multiple directions and then do clockwise and counterclockwise. One of my favorite exercises for helping with the knee, and it's something that's really overlooked in um, a lot of um, patients, is doing the tibialis anterior raises. These are also known as toe raises. So what it does is it works on engaging the tibialis anterior muscle specifically, which is an important ankle dorsiflexor. So the tibialis anterior attaches to the superior lateral part of your tibia and then crosses the ankle and attaches to multiple bones in the foot. And its main thing is to lift your toes and dorsiflex the ankle, or sorry, not lift the toes, but dorsiflex the ankle when you walk. So if you find that you're having to bend your knee more when you're walking, it could be because you have a weaker tibialis anterior muscle. And next we have calf raises. So a lot of times we just do regular calf raises, but it might be a good idea to try them in a stretch position. So when you do calf raises in a lengthened position, it's a more functional way to strengthen the plantar flexors of your feet because it mimics how you would push off your toes when you're walking, running and hiking. We never walk really flat footed. We're always pushing off our toes when we're going up and doing things. So this is a really good way to kind of optimize and strengthen your plantar flexors, which include your gastrocnemius, your soleus, as well as your tibialis posterior. Squat, squat light. So squats, great exercise to strengthen the muscles around your knee and your hip, particularly your quads and your glutes but I really wanted to touch on this and highlight this. If this is one thing that you take from this presentation, it is this. The most important thing to do when you're squatting is to squat in a comfortable position for your body. No body is made the same. People have longer tibias, longer femurs. The hips can be rotated specifically where it could be more painful to squat with a narrow stance versus a wider stance. So it's really important to squat in the comfortable position for you. So some ways that you can do this is if you need to, squat with a wider stance. You can have your feet externally rotated a little bit so your toes are pointing out a bit more. And then if you have limited ankle dorsiflexion, you can put something underneath your heels, such as a plate, or even stack up a few towels, that kind of thing if you're doing it at home and don't have access to plates. And then that kind of takes out those limiting factors and allows you to squat more comfortably. Some things you want to avoid when you're squatting is you want to prevent, you from your knee, prevent your knee from collapsing into valgus. And you want to prevent your hips or your pelvis shifting to one side and having your feet shifting or turning out during your squat. So like I said, it's okay to have your feet turned out, but you don't want your feet to be moving or turning as you're squatting. You want to have a nice, stable base of support. Imagine that you're pushing your feet into the ground. <clears throat> okay, so now getting to some more knee specific exercises. One thing that I like to do to kind of warm up the knees is to do banded heel slides. This helps to work on knee flexion and extension. And it's just a good way to kind of get things working. And if you have reduced knee flexion, this is a good way to help train that and work on that. Another exercise that I started doing recently is called wall lunges. So you wanna find a corner of the wall and you're gonna perform a lunge with the inside of your knee against the wall. The wall acts as a, gu as a guide and helps prevent knee valgus and internal rotation. So when your hip kind of turns in and helps keep your hip, knee and ankle in the same plane. So if you find that your knee starts to go into valgus or cave in, give this exercise a try. It is definitely harder than it looks because it's really hard to keep everything in the same plane when your knee is so used to caving in. Okay. Lunges. So you can do lunges 
blocking lunges, reverse lunges, they're all great. One thing I wanted to touch on is that if your knee goes over your toes when you lunge, that's okay. Our knees go over our toes when we walk, run, and go downstairs. So strengthening that position can help can help improve control doing during those activities. So don't worry if your knee goes over your toes during some of the exercises, but you don't want to push it to the point where you're experiencing pain in the knee or at the joint line with your knees going past your toes. Um, another exercise that I started doing in the last year that I find has really helped is called elephant walk. Funny name, but really good. It's harder than it looks too. So you're gonna start standing in an upright position, bend forward, walk your hands out in front of you until your heels are slightly off the ground. Then you're gonna bend both knees and then you're gonna straighten one leg at a time by contracting your quads. So that's the important part is you're contracting your quads. And this also places a stretch in the back of your knee and in your hamstrings. So it helps to also improve hamstring flexibility. And then you can do about 20 to 30 per side kind of thing. Let me know how it goes. All right. One of my favorite exercises is Bulgarian split squats. And this is a more functional way to do squats for people with longer femurs. I have longer femurs. My squat technique is not the greatest because I have a hard time to get my butt close to the floor because my knees just keep wanting going forward. So I started doing these and it's a really good way to load the quads and also load the glutes. So you can see in the image here that if you have your torso more upright, you're gonna get more activation through your quads. If you bend your torso, keeping your spine nice and neutral, of course, then you get more glute activation. So it's a nice exercise. So if you want to hit your quads more when you're doing exercises or get more glute focus, you can kind of change up your position and then you can still use the same exercise. Slant board squats. So these ones are hard to do if you don't have a slant board, but we will be having one at the new clinic when we move. But it's a great way to do squats if you have decreased ankle dorsiflexion. So you can work on the training the end ranges of your knee and your hip, and it just takes out that limiting factor. I have a little bit of reduced ankle dorsiflexion. So for me to squat, this is a great way to kind of get down to my end ranges in my hip and my knee, and then get good explosive movement through my quad and hips and glutes so they come back up. All right. <clears throat> so two of these exercises here focus on eccentric contraction of the quads and eccentric contraction of the hamstrings. So an eccentric contraction is when you're working the muscle through a lengthened position. So if you think of doing a bicep curl, if you're bringing your hand towards your shoulder, that is a concentric contraction. The bicep is shortening. As you bring your hand down to straighten your arm, the bicep is still working, but it's working eccentrically because it's lengthening during that movement. So the Nordic hamstring curls, these are a great way to get your hamstring activation. And don't feel like when you're doing these exercises that you need to go straight to the ground. You need to have something elevated or put a box that you're gonna put your hands on as you come down, then that's totally fine. But make sure you have your arms out so you don't just land straight on your face. The reverse Nordics are a great way to get eccentric contraction of the quads and hip flexors. And you're just gonna be on your knees and then you're just gonna lean back and really feel a nice stretch as you're lowering your body back and then coming back up. Another one I like to do to get the hamstrings activated is a glute bridge walkout. So you start in a glute bridge and then you're gonna slowly walk your feet out away from your hips and then walk them back in. So as you're walking your heels out, you're getting hamstring activation. And the farther your feet are away from your hips, the more you'll feel it in your hamstring. Okay, moving on to the hip. The muscles of the hip are really important in stabilizing the knee and preventing knee valgus when you walk, run and squat, as I mentioned before. And in terms of exercises that strengthen your hip, you wanna think about all the movements of the hip. There are six movements that our hips do. They flex and extend, AKA forward and backward movements. They adduct and abduct, side to side movements. And they also do rotation, internal and external. So kind of like twisting motions there. So when you're exercising your hip, most people just do movements that go forward and backward. But 
that's going to help you if you're just going to be walking a straight line. But if you have to take a quick step to the side to dodge your dog who's run off somewhere, or if you want to play um, sports with your kids or grandkids, having strength in the lateral movements as well as in the rotational movements is really important to kind of get an overall good stabilization of the hip. So I have some exercises that highlight um, and work the hip in all these positions. So in the sagittal plane, squats that we mentioned before, gluten bridges as well. But I want to touch base here that single leg exercises are really important. So it's great if you're doing squats and everything, but you want to be able to do single leg movements if you're able to, because when we walk, <laughs> run, jump, hike, we're doing everything on one leg. And so you wanna make sure that you're strong in that single leg plane as well from side to side. So if you have one side that you notice it's a little bit weaker, then it's important to work on that single leg strength. Because a lot of the times if you do double leg exercises, your stronger leg could kind of dominate and take over that movement. So you wanna make sure that you get good strength on both legs. I need to do that. Okay. Next one we have is um, hip hinging, and then that can transition into a deadlift oh, really? and single leg Romanian deadlift. So for the hip hinge, if you're not sure how to do one here, we always show them at the clinic. If you come in for appointment, it's a very common exercise that we prescribe. The key thing is you want to keep your spine nice and neutral. One thing that I tell all my patients is you want your head to follow your chest. You don't want to have your head up because then that's going to put your neck into extension. So you want to make sure that everything's nice and neutral there. And then you can start adding weight once you kind of get the movement more comfortable and then go to the single leg. And this one's a great exercise, works on stabilizing the glute here. You're working on your single leg balance as well as proprioception in your feet. I have no balance, I can't do that. Exercises in the sagittal plane as well that are great are step ups, you can do forward, you can do reverse step, step down, as well as you can do step ups to the side. One that I like to do is called the Patrick step. And this one is you're working on your step down. So if you have pain when you're going downstairs or hiking downhill, this is a good exercise to work on to help train the hips and to stabilize, as well as the knee to not to go in as you do that step down. And if you do this exercise, it's important to work on the control of it. So you don't wanna do it really fast, but you wanna do it nice and slow. So you actually work on and you can feel the muscles engaging and controlling that movement down. Okay, so some exercises in the frontal plane. So these are gonna work your um, glutes as well as your adductors. So the airplanes one, this is, this is a little bit more advanced exercise, but you can start with doing a single leg balance then moving to a single leg remaining deadlift. And then this one is still you're on one leg and then you're just opening up your hip using your arms as a balance and you're just training the hip in that internal and external rotation. Cossack squats. So these are a little bit of variation of doing like a side lunge. And the only really difference is, is that you're just getting your toe up nice and high but just gets a bit more activation in the glute, I find, than a side lunge. And then you feel a little bit of a stretch on the inner thigh in your groin or adductor muscles. Copenhagen planks here. I really like this exercise for getting the adductor muscles or your groin muscles firing. One thing that most people don't know is that training your adductors is really good at preventing and strength, preventing knee valgus and strengthening the inside of the knee. So that's a really, this is a really good exercise or even doing um, hip adduction where you just bring your hip across in front of you, trying to strengthen in that plane as well too. So this one, you wanna start with both feet. So one knee on the chair and then one foot on the ground. And then as you get more, as you get more strength and feel confident, you wanna bring that bottom leg and try and bring it up close to the chair. That way you get activation in both, both adductor muscles. Okay, so I think this is the last exercise slide. And these are just showing some exercises that you can do in the transverse plane. These ones are more mobility exercises. So it's really important to have good hip mobility. So the one on the left here is called standing hip cars. And it's just 
when you're doing it in a standing position, you're gonna hold on to something and you're just working on moving the hip in all directions. So flexing the hip up, bringing it out to the side and then bringing it back. And then you're gonna do that movement in reverse. Oh, oh, lastly, you. lastly is the 90-90 hip mobility exercise. And this one's a great way to just work on your mobility. It's a nice one to get the, you get some hip flexion activation. You can see as she leans forward, that's where you're gonna be working on that hip flexion activation. And then as you lean back, gain a little bit of a stretch and gain some activation on the back leg as well too. And with all these exercises, just wanna like make a note that don't feel like you have to do all of them. These are just some ideas and some tips and tricks that you can take home and hopefully they'll help with some of your knee pain. Important always to stretch because if you have a tight muscle that can pull on the joint, then that can cause some increased pain or limitations other, in other areas of the body. Especially like if you have tight hamstrings, that's gonna pull on your hip and then that could put more pressure into your back as well too. So some stretches that I like to give my patients and that I do at home as well is the elevated hamstring stretch. So you're gonna have, first off, legs straight. You can have your foot on chair, stool, bench, whatever works best for you. And this one targets the distal hamstrings, the posterior knee and the upper calves. And then another variation that most people forget to do is to actually stretch your hamstrings with your knee bent. And this targets the proximal hamstrings up here. And then another one that's usually for most people that muscles are tight is our calf muscles. So these are just two exercise, two calf stretches that you can do against the wall. And then just trying to stretch out our plantar flexors and our calves here. Mm -hmm. Lastly, for the stretches is we have the half kneeling hip flexor stretch and the couch stretch. Both these exercises do the same thing. They stretch the hip flexors and the quadriceps but I wanted to show them both because if you have limited knee flexion, this one might not be as comfortable for your knee. So then you can do it with your back leg straight here. And one thing that I want to highlight is when you're doing it, you don't wanna lean your hips forward to stretch your hip flexors, but when you wanna imagine that you're pulling up your pubic bone, so the, the bone that's kind of below your stomach and your abdomen, and you're gonna imagine that you're pulling that up towards the sky, and then you're gonna find your tailbone and then you imagine that you're tucking your tailbone underneath. So this does a posterior pelvic tilt and this really helps to yeah. stretch the hip flexors and the quads without leaning your body forward. I lied, we still have more stretches to go through, but we're almost <laughs> done. <laughs> so we have the figure four stretch. This one's great for targeting your pure hey, uh, muscle. Jordan, and sorry to interrupt. Yep. Um, hey, Sandy, your mic is back on for some reason. Oh, and sorry. We can hear you chatting back there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the piriformis stretch targets the glutes and the piriformis through here. This is a great one to do. If you find that this is too hard to get into position, you can start with your foot on the ground and you can just add pressure to your knee to deepen that stretch. The frog stretch here. It's also great for targeting tight adductors, AKA our groin. And it's a nice one, just kind of work on that. I find this one can be a little bit uncomfortable for my knee because I have some medial knee pain. So I actually prefer to do the side lunge adductor stretch here. And it just works on the inner thigh stretching through here. But I just wanted to give some different options for people who don't have medial knee pain and can get into this position a bit more easily. Or if you do, like I do, then you can do the side lunge adductor stretch. Okay, so we're done through all the exercises. I hope that was kind of a little educational and gave you some ideas of what you could add to your exercise routine for your knee rehab. Now I want to touch base on some nutritional recommendations. So there's a little bit of controversy in regards to the research in regards to some of these, but what I found um, for myself and for most people is if you try it and it works, you may as well do it. So the first one is glucosamine chondroitin. These are two compounds that are found naturally occurring in cartilage. And there is some controversy about this, but it can be helpful for people in managing joint pain and reducing inflammation if you have osteoarthritis. Collagen supplements and bone broth are both other good options. 
They're an excellent support for the joints and connective tissues surrounding the joints. They can help improve knee joint symptoms, pain, stiffness, physical and physical function in people with osteoarthritis. I take a collagen supplement every day, and it's more to the fact that I don't necessarily feel like I have time or I'm too lazy to make my own bone broth. But bone broth is definitely more nutritious than collagen supplements because it contains more amino acids to help support the immune, gut, and cardiovascular health. So if you have access to bone broth or if you have a cooked chicken, just put that in your slow cooker or boil it, and then you can drink that broth um, the next day. The important thing with these ones is you have to be consistent. So you have to take it on a daily basis to really feel the results. In my opinion, that's what I found. Last thing is turmeric with black pepper. So turmeric is an anti-inflammatory and it can really help with um, inflammation. I cook with it all the time. But important thing that most people don't know is that you need to take it with black pepper because black pepper helps to activate the anti-inflammatory properties of turmeric. All right, and then this is the one that no one wants to hear, but there's some inflammatory foods that you can avoid that increase arthritic pain. So it's all the good stuff, sweets, dairy, fatty foods, refined carbs, tobacco and alcohol, gluten, and any additives or preservatives. And then that's not to say that you don't ever have to eat these foods. They're just so, if you are feeling some inflammation in the knee and you have arthritic pain, it might be a good idea to just try reducing your intake or cutting some of these out. But I always like to follow the 80-20 rule. So if you haven't heard of the 80-20 rule, the 80-20 rule is 80% of the time you eat healthy, you do what you're supposed to do. And then 20% of the time you get to cheat and have a little bit of fun. So you can have that glass of wine or beer here and there, or have those that cake that you've been eyeing up at the bakery, that kind of thing. So 80-20 rule, everything in moderation. All right. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. Uh, do we have any questions?